What's up, everybody? What up, Billy? How's it going? Hey, how are you? Good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching with us live. Um, we got an early one today. We've been doing them early lately, and we have a very special guest that I'm super excited for. But uh, here we go, Jump Street episode 143. How you doing, Austin? I'm good. The uh, I've noticed that we have a, a big shout out now from the international and European crowd that we do it earlier now because they can actually watch it live too, which is better for them. So we get everybody going in now with the early episodes. Yeah. I like that. We need a bigger audience that way. I'm pumped. I can't wait. Uh, this is up. like, th this was someone on the wish list for sure. And like the more I started doing research on it, the more I was getting excited to talk to him. So yeah, me too. <laughs> I cannot wait for this, especially like, you know, it's funny. I was skating with uh, Parker yesterday and he was like, who, you know, who is that? And like, cause he's from like a different generation. Like yeah. he was so like prominent in our generation, but he uh, ended up like not being a part, like in like the mid to late, 2000s like as actively because he got into other things and so people that started in that era aren't as familiar but for us he's like a legend and he's been yeah. around forever been on like the tv all these things and had like an amazing career inside and outside of rollerblading so i'm super excited to get into it but first i'm going to uh, <laughs> but first i'm going to get into a quick little spiel please if you don't already you might have heard this 143 times but if you don't already please follow us on all of our social media platforms we have a Facebook. You can give us a like. We have an Instagram. You can follow us. Uh, we have a YouTube page. If you like what you're hearing, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can get a notification when we're watching a live episode. And you can come join us live while we're doing it. Join the chat. Be a part of it. Uh, we have a iTunes. Again, if you like what you're hearing, you can give us a five-star rating, a review. And we also have a Patreon. You can be a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. You have exclusive content. We have inside outs. We have trick tips. We have um, section reviews with our guests. You're automatically entered to win something from our online store uh, every month. You get to ask questions to our guests in our Patreon uh, section. So if you want to be a part of the episode, you can very much be a part of it and ask a question to our guests. So all that for $3 a month. And you support this episode and you support this show. And, Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, for that, that's my feel for the day. <laughs> yeah, I hear an echo too. I hear an echo in my headphones. Someone in the live chat said they hear an echo too, Austin. Um, I don't know what that would be from on this end. I hope that goes away. I think it just echoes with you. I don't know what that's coming. No, from. I'm hearing it. I'm, I'm still hearing it from you. Um, is your like computer speakers on somehow by any chance? I Maybe. don't think it's me. Um, I hope it goes away because I've never heard that before, but I'm going to carry on in the meantime and try to sort this out throughout the episode. Cause I can't figure it out right now, <laughs> but, um, I, I, for our Patreon, uh, new Patreon members last week, I was like, you guys are really testing me in this one because there were some wild names. And then I got messages saying from half the people like, Hey, you pronounced my name perfectly. No one ever does it correctly. And then I got just as many uh, messages of people like you completely butchered my name. <laughs> so we'll, I'll try to get it better for now on. But this week, I want to thank uh, Richard Vasquez, Charlie Huguenard, Luis Morales, and A. Marietta. Thank you for being new members of our Patreon and supporting this channel. Uh, if you want to be a member, there's a link in the video description to check it out. And speaking of Patreon members, we have a WTF brought to us by our Patreon member, Chris Deister of the homie right here, Franco Camayo, with a did you see this one billy like a rough tough x grind no i haven't Ooh, look at that. that this is such a franco trick if you know franco um this is like the most franco of franco tricks right here he's always into the weird shit it's like a tough x grind rough x grind both on the edges i don't know if i've seen this one before but super cool also the spot they're skating too this is like a diy little handicap mellow down rail that thing looks fun as hell yeah, it looks like it's at um, one of the homies' houses. I think it's at Joey's house, probably. He's got like a whole mini skate park at his place. So jealous of that. But hell yeah. Shout out to the That's homie Franco Camayo. About time we had some <laughs> some Franco presence on this show, considering he's been our boy forever. Yeah, that's a typical Franco style trick as well. <laughs> he always did like... Why are you laughing? Because like I, I said it too, and you say it too, and like we understand that. Maybe other people might not understand it so much, but to us, we're like, oh, yeah, that's so Franco right there. 
Yeah, because like I think he was doing the rough grinds forever, and he had like um like the rough fish brain like back in the day, which is like super hard and like not possible. Yeah. But he was also doing like the tough grinds with like the toe before like anyone was like really accepting those as like legitimate tricks. He was doing like uh, like tough soles and tough other tricks. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Blade till dead in the chest. I would just call it the rough rider. <laughs> I kind of like rough that rider. one. Hey, my cats are being bad in the background. Um, yeah, so I think that's it we have for the top of the show. Anything else, Billy, on your end? Um, no, I, I'm, I am concerned about this echo. Yeah, I, um, there's like no settings for an echo of any kind, and I don't know what that's about. I'm going to unplug my microphone and plug it back in. Maybe that helps. <laughs> Maybe maybe try the same for you to see if that does anything. And I feel like it made it worse when I did that. I've never had this before. Yeah. Ugh. Not cool. <laughs> it's okay. Well, try. try I don't try, know. Just this unplug. My field. Unplug your your head your microphone and plug it back. Okay, we're good to go. I'll introduce Mike in the meantime while uh, we sort this out. But everyone, please welcome my very special guest. If you don't know him, you know him now. Mike Budnick. What's going on, guys? There we go. There's the intro. There's the cheers. <laughs> Sorry we're a little unprofessional at this show, but this is the Jump Street way. So this is rollerblading right here. It might have been a while for you, but now you could get used to it again. <laughs> yeah. Man, I love it, guys. I, I, I really Billy, appreciate muted, you asking me to come on. Yeah, thank you for coming on. This is awesome, too. We've been talking about you for a while, like Billy said before. And um, to have you on, it's awesome. I'm glad you're excited to be on as well. It's going to be a fun episode. Yeah, definitely. Billy, you back? Oh, uh, Billy's trying to, <laughs> I think Billy's trying to figure something out now. We don't, we don't hear you, Billy. I think you're muted. And I still have the, okay, Billy, Billy's got it. <laughs> okay, this is, just, all right. So let's just do this for now in the meantime. I'll, I'll kickstart the show in the meantime for everyone watching. Sorry about the, the troubles right now. But Mike, we're super pumped to have you on. There's so much history with you and... Like Billy said before we started the show, we found out something about you recently that we never knew before that you were from Brooklyn. But we usually start the show with um, starting off our guests, explaining how you got into skating, kind of like your intro to the sport. So for the people who don't know, uh, let's get started with that. So for those of you that don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm super old. Um, I've, I've been around for a while, but I... Uh, as you were saying, I grew up in Brooklyn, and in, in Brooklyn, we we were skating back in, and this is just roller skating. Like, you know, if I go back into the early '80s, from like '80 80 to '86, um, man, I if, if you just wanted to get somewhere, it was either you grab your bike, or you grab your skates, and you you go wherever you want to go. If you wanted to get to to the park or whatever, um, so it was just a, an effective mode of transportation to get to get around and then obviously we'd all skate whatever we saw we'd jump over things but in 1987 my grandmother my mom's mom bought me a pair of those red and blue with a metal frame uh blade runners that rollerblade made in 1987 Jeez. and she gave them to me for my birthday and man i loved my roller skates like really 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 loved my roller skates and my my grandmother bought me these things. I'm like, man, these things are horrible. <laughs> like I had, I had no interest at all in putting those things on my feet. And I never did. I, I took them and I threw them in my closet. I thanked her. I gave her a kiss. And then I, I put my, my roller skates back on. And then it was probably six months later and uh, my skates broke. And my friends were all going out and they were going to go skate somewhere. And... Um, I was like, man, I, I don't have skates. And I remembered I had these red and blue things sitting in my closet up in uh, up in my bedroom. So I went to my room and I started digging through everything. And I found these these Blade Runner skates with, again, they were like bright red and blue with this white metal frame, which is a bunch of holes. So you put the wheels basically wherever you wanted in the things. And uh, I threw them on my feet. And I'm not kidding. I have, it sounds so cheesy, but it's like, nothing ever felt so right as the next hour of my life. Like I, I put those things on and I left my house and man, I just never took them off. If you go back to like, I graduated high school in 92. And if you look back at, at like 
what was written in my yearbook about me, every comment is about me having skates on my feet. And my my own mother, you know, they get to, to enter a little phrase or whatever about what they think you're going to do in the future. And my mom's comment in 1992 was, I don't know what he's going to be doing, but I guarantee you he has the skates on. And it was like, man, nothing ever clicked or felt so right as it did in that, you know, that, I guess it was like, November of 1987 and I mean I just never looked back I I started skating then and you know the the X Games and all the competitions and sponsorship yeah it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing until the mid 90s so you know basically spent eight years living with my skates on and just building any kind of random ramp I can build and and I ended up moving in uh the late 80s i ended up moving to sparta new jersey which is in sussex county it's the northwest corner of jersey and as a kid that grew up in brooklyn to now be out in what to me was the like it literally looked like the jungle there were trees everywhere it was just nuts and there were these huge hills everywhere so man i put my skates on and just bombed down these hills and uh you know absolutely loved it but that that's how it started i i i that's how I first got into putting skates on my feet. That's that's how I fell in love with skating. And then when things started to progress through the early 90s and, you know, again, before any competitions, before 95, when the X Games started, um, there was a bunch of us that got into skating, some of the, the half pipes that were around. And we started doing shows at state fairs in Central Park, you know, whatever we could find, whatever we could do. You know, the, the, the reality that that we were we were getting paid a couple hundred bucks to to skate these half pipes that were being built for us was just just absolutely insane. I mean, we would have paid a couple hundred bucks to skate the ramps that they were building for us, and and we were getting paid to do it. But and I mean, that's back in the days. It was it was me, Aton, Steve O'Donnell, uh, Eddie Campos. If you know, if anyone doesn't know Eddie Campos, that's that's someone that needs to be talked about more in skating history. And he's been mentioned on the show many times before. Yeah, let me true. let me do a little switcheroo with everybody now that Billy's back real fast. Um, don't know why this doesn't work like it should. <laughs> this is how we do on Jump Street. Why doesn't this work now? Austin, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not like... Austin's like, let's check the mics. And now bring in Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, sorry about that. Hey, Mike, I was listening to everything you said. I'm just curious. And uh, where in Brooklyn are you from? Uh, Flatlands, over by you know, close to Kings Plaza, Flatlands and Marine Park area. Damn, sick! And then to Sparta, New Jersey. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to come in late, but you were talking about Eton Kramer, uh, John O'Donnell, and also is it John O'Donnell or? Steve, Steve O'Donnell and, and obviously Eddie Campos. There we go. Eddie. R.I.P. Eddie. Dude, absolutely. I mean, talk about legend. That guy, what he did for skating in the in the Northeast and like he was basically like a dad to all of us. He was he was the best of us. He you know, he skated his face off and he was the first one doing every single trick that was out there. You know. I ended up uh you know, I was I was friends with Aton, like we skated together from time to time, but we ended up going on a trip to Israel together in uh, in the mid '90s, like right around '95-ish, and uh, it was me, Steve O'Donnell, Eddie Campos, and Aton. We went to we got flown out to Tel Aviv in Israel to to do some shows out there, and uh, you know that's when me and Aton became like we were like brothers. After that trip, we ended up moving to California together, and then you know once we moved to California in the mid '90s, there that's when obviously the X Games started, the competition started, and uh, you know, people were getting sponsored and you know transitioned into that whole world for the next 10 years or so yeah that was wild i'm, I'm sorry we, we're, we're gonna get our rhythm back right now so i apologize about that but um so yeah you were like you were around in like the very beginning of when the x game started in 1995 i believe the x game started correct or was it 94 94 is when this uh first started and 95 was the the first x games and i didn't i i decided you know obviously there was before 95 there was nobody was making any money or doing anything it wasn't a job i mean i still skated every day i moved to florida 
in uh, 93, 94. And I still, man, I had my skates on every single day. I was either skating street or on a ramp every single day. There's a huge, there was a huge core group of guys down there. Um, there's a dude named Elmer that, uh, you know, he was like the, the main guy. He was like setting up shows and just getting everyone to skate every day. I mean, I remember back in those days, we'd go, we'd go down to Miami to go street skate. And this little tiny dude would show up out of nowhere and just make us all look so stupid. And we'd be trashing these places and, you know, like trying to hit any rail we could or try to figure out how to do everything we were seeing like Arlo do back in and, and Chris do back in the early, uh, like the very beginning of Daily Bread and stuff. And we'd be trying to do all the stuff that we saw. And this little dude would come out of nowhere. And I mean, he was super, super tiny and just kill everybody and just trash everything we, we touched. And then years later, I see him show up at a contest and it was it was Aaron Feinberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Feinberg used to come skate with us all the time back in, in Miami. That, I mean, I can't even, I don't even know how old he was back then. It was probably like, I mean, like 11 or 12 or something. It's crazy. But yeah, the, the X game started in 95. NIST started in 94. I didn't, I was in Florida at those during that time. And in 95, I was going back to college. I wasn't like, there there wasn't anything to try to aspire to as far as a career goes or anything like that. It wasn't even something anyone would consider unless you were Chris Edwards living in California. Like I, I know the, the team rollerblade guys had had a thing going on in California, but other than that, there, were, there really wasn't anything else. So I was back in Florida doing uh, the college thing and, and uh, getting on with my life. And NIS in 95 ended up putting on a contest in Miami, right on Ma in South beach in Miami. And uh, one of my friends, convinced me to go enter it and i went down i entered street and vert i did a i don't remember what i i made the finals on street but didn't place or whatever and then i ended up winning the vert competition and in 95 if you won the vert competition then uh part of winning it if you won any of the competitions part of winning it came with a free trip to california to compete in the, the finals at the end of the season hmm. so towards the end of 95 there they uh Ness flew us out to to Venice and they had their big like Ness national whatever world championship event and uh that was really my first time getting to meet like all of like the real core group of skaters it's first time I met Sessa first time I met Manuel Belarus and Chris Edwards actually I had met Chris Edwards years before that but I'm um, just doing shows and things but um more as a fan than anything else not like a I wasn't really skating with them but um yeah, so that 95 NIST finals was my first time going out to California, first time getting to skate with all of those guys, going to the Fern Ramp and to Spawn Ranch and like the whole whole nine yards of, of getting into it. And it was it was at that moment right there that I, I man, much to my, my parents' dismay, I decided I didn't want to go to college anymore. I wanted to move to California. I wanted to be a skater. It was like all I wanted to do was be on my skates all day. Um, yeah, but that, that's basically the genesis or the, the start of it all. Yeah, um, that makes sense, like uh, not thinking that there's a career in it and then going out to California to the finals and then seeing people like Cesar, Pete Manuel Blair, as people from Australia, like a thriving potential of what can be in the future of skating and like also like the inception of the X Games and this had started just a few years before. It seemed like probably things were blossoming and there was like potential for there for it to be something in the career. Yeah, and the biggest thing really in those days was – and. Man, over the years, I've heard a lot of people shit on it, but there was a ton of, like, shows that you could do. So, I mean, I did tours of Six Flags, Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland, Dollywood. Like, all of these places would, would set up a half pipe or, or some kind of launch show or something and basically pay you to come out for two weeks and and do these shows. And, man, again, if, if you rewind to if, – if you if, – if you can have some sense of perspective and rewind to those days, like 93, 94, 95. And I mean, when I lived in Florida, the only half pipe you could skate was, it was a place called Badlands in Orlando. And I lived in Boca Raton at the time. So Orlando was like th over three hours away. So if I wanted to skate a half pipe, I would drive six, six to seven hours round trip through traffic and then pay to skate, uh, a rickety old ramp that just beat the hell out of you 
And then there's this other option where someone's going to pay me to go spend uh, two weeks at an amusement park where people are paying hundreds hundred of dollars to go, do some shows, get to be on my skates all day, skate these beautiful, like, well-built ramps. It was like, it was freaking paradise. It was the best, it was the best of times. Like, I, there's, there's, those days of traveling with those guys doing those shows were just the best of days. Just being on the road. We were, we had a trailer behind us. We'd pull the ramp with us from place to place and set it up and, and it was the best of times. I like what you said about the vert ramp thing, because that's like always puzzled me about vert skaters. Like unless you have a local vert ramp, which most people don't, they're so rare. Even nowadays, it's more rare than it was back then. Like you had to drive six hours round trip to skate a vert ramp, but you were still competing as a vert skater. Like that blows my mind right there that you were able to practice enough to be that good at vert. Honestly, that's a I, that dude I mentioned earlier, Elmer from uh from fort lauderdale he went out he just loved vert skating and he would never do any street skating he just lived for vert skating and there was this guy elmer and this guy paul from uh from fort lauderdale and there was a whole other group of people from down there and they went out and bought they they hooked up with a local skate shop called skaters edge in fort lauderdale and got skaters edge to go out and buy uh one of the it was ironic. They actually bought one of the half pipes that we used to pull around to do shows with up in New York and set it up in a warehouse and they would be out there every single day. So once we got to that point, that's when when people started to get pretty good is is, you know, obviously driving seven hours round trip to Orlando for a year and a half. It was hard to get good at anything. And plus you get there and if if you it's hard for me to even remember. I've been hitting the head so many times, but <laughs> Um, if I remember Badlands correctly, it had a badass mini ramp. It had a, a, a concrete pool, it had a nice street course section. It had like this crazy spine section and it had the vert ramp. And my biggest problem with skating is I genuinely love doing all of it. Like I, I loved my days. There was a dude in New York named Knuff that I used to skate with all the time uh, yeah. back when I lived in New York. And, and so whether I was going to meet him in new york and skating street or or meeting some guys at a ramp and skate like i just wanted to do it all so when i would go to badlands i have all of these different things that i could skate on and instead of just going to the vert ramp be like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna train and practice and get really good at vert i'd be on the vert ramp for like like 10 runs and then i'd see people over on the mini ramp and i'd go over there and then i'd see people hitting the pool and i'd go over there um but yeah it, it, it it was difficult back in those days, especially now. I mean, I've got a, I've got kids now. My, and that's really how I got back into skating because I, once I started fighting, I, I didn't skate. I mean, I literally went from having skates on my feet for ninety percent of my life for twenty years to literally not even seeing my skates for probably eight years, and then my son grew up a little bit and started to find out a little bit about what I did and. Um, he had friends that scootered and skateboarded, and he had one friend that rollerbladed. And uh, he started to have some interest in going to a skate park. I was like, I'll take you to a skate park. I'd love to go skate again. And uh, I reached out to Tom Heiser, and he, he hooked me up with a, a pair of skates from Rollerblade. And, um, you know, it, it was almost immediate. Like, I started skating again every day, and I just fell back in love with it. Started going to Blading Cup uh, to, to skate with those guys. And, you know, it's just been great. That's so cool to uh, hear about the trajectory of like you skating, going into fighting, coming back. And I want to go more in depth into it, but I've, I've, I've spoken to some bladers who have like left and come back. And I think it's important sometimes to have that distance. So you have like the appreciation for you for it when you come back, like when you when you're immersed in it so much the whole time, you almost kind of take it for granted. But then when you're not involved and you come back and you're like, wow, this this really is fun. And especially you get to share that experience with your kids. Yeah, I, I mean, I genuinely, and, and this will probably piss people off, but genuinely, I grew to hate skating. Like, I, I got to a point in, like, after, like, 2004-ish that, and it was my own fault. Like, it's nobody's fault but my own. I got, I got, I started to get, I had picked up some corporate sponsors and started to get paid decently and, 
it got to the point where I went from spending my entire life putting my skates on because I wanted to, because I wanted to have them on and I wanted to do something on them to being told to put my skates on and being told this is what they want me to do with my skates on. And right. you know, it wasn't even an extreme form of that. It's not like anybody was telling me like, do this or you're fired or anything like that. But, but having that obligation tied to it just sucked the joy out of it. And it's hard. I struggle with it. I, I, there's the side of it that, man, the opportunities that I had and a lot of us had in the late nineties, early two thousands to, to travel and make some money. Like I wouldn't take that back for a second. It was, the reality is, is it was freaking amazing. It was great. It was such an, an insane life experience. Um, but it did, it, it, it ended up for a while there sucking the joy out of it. And it wasn't until I saw my son that on, on a ramp that, that it reconnected it for me. It made me like, like, instantly feel that that joy again of just 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 to roll around like it, you know it was it was something i missed so it was good to be back yeah you you, you can definitely forget those things um like when the the pure joy of when you start skating like what it is to just like enjoy being able to roll around and have that experience the excitement behind it and then like if you have the opportunity to go pro and you become a pro it brings all these other factors in that make it less enjoyable because it's not purely about the fun you're having obligations you're having to do this and although it's like and i can relate to that as like a former pro skater so like having like it's like you said it's a privilege of an experience but it also like brings all these other elements into the equation where it's like oh that's not really particularly i'm losing the joy for it or like the simple joy for it um Right. It's cool to hear that you found it back because I definitely know people that have been resentful of skating. Like, I hate this. I want to separate myself from what that brings. And they haven't been able to, like, rediscover the joy. But it's cool to hear that through uh, your children that you're able to to find that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's amazing. And, and it was such a huge life lesson, too, because when I, <clears throat> when I got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA and started fighting, and I didn't make the same mistakes. I, I, I did not, I know now, obviously I'm a lot older and I have a lot more experience. Like, man, making money is not difficult. If, if, if anyone out there is listening and they're complaining that, that it's, it's hard to make money, you're just not working. Like it's, it's pretty easy to go out there and, and make a living if you're willing to do some work. So when it came to fighting and stuff like that, I never felt like, oh, I, I got to get all these sponsors. I need to make sure that people are paying me for this and that. And I didn't take any sponsors. I got a lot of offers. I ended up taking a, an equipment sponsor who just agreed to give me a bunch of free training gear so that I can get ready for fights, which I was fine with. I, I was I used their gear anyway, so they just sent me some free stuff. But I never, not one time ever in, in fighting or jujitsu did I ever have somebody, uh, try, I'm trying to remember because that might be a lie. Maybe someone did pay me once. I don't remember, but I, it was never, it was never a, a thing of mine. Like I, I didn't, I did not want that to ever happen to me again. So I did learn from it. And because of that, I have now, I mean, I've trained MMA and jujitsu since basically, I mean, I wrestled my whole life, but doing like this stuff since 2002. So 20 something years now. And I still, I went and trained yesterday and I loved every second of it. That's awesome, awesome that you were able to like learn from skating to make your next stage stage in life that much better. Like the MMA, you learn from that. And now that, that could have been a completely different thing. You could have got tired of MMA after like five years for the same thing as, as skating did. And you speak the truth too, because a lot of other, I don't know, a lot of our viewers might not know that, but some pros in the past have said something similar to that, where it do, they do get jaded by it. And when it comes to the sponsor stuff, you're from a foreign a foreign generation of skaters where nowadays we can't picture like corporate sponsors having to be on like ASA tours, X games tours, uh, traveling for, you know, uh, like I said, doing shows and stuff like that. Like, that's not so common these days. Being a pro skater now is so much more laid back. Uh, granted there's not as much money in it, but I'm sure there's like a healthy balance of some sort that we all need to figure out to learn that where we can make skating and be pro skaters as a living, but be able to enjoy it still because that's why we do it all in the first place, you know? Right. Man, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you though, that like, I still follow it a ton. I watch your, I watch, I watch the podcast religiously. I, I follow all of my favorite skaters and it absolutely kills me that 
that that some of these guys are not just getting freaking paid like Michael Jordan type money because the stuff that's being done right now compared and obviously the equipment's changed and the the the, the stuff you can use to get better has has trained has changed but uh man I um I watch some of these people's clips and it like my jaw drops it's just absolutely insane what's being done on a pair of skates nowadays i mean i'm i always wished i could one of my biggest regrets is i wish i could go back and articulate better why i skated because i was different than than other people and uh you know there's guys like eric burke and nick riggle and dominic sagona and and arlo and josh petty and all of these guys that are truly and you could see it in their later lives. Like, look at what every one of those people became after skating, and every one of them is an artist. When they would put skates on, everything they did on a pair of skates was an, an expression of art to them. And to me, that wasn't the case. Like, I, and, and a lot, most people would disagree with me, man. I, I don't give a fuck. Most people would disagree <laughs> and say that I'm doing it wrong, but I, I don't care. And I wish I could go back to being younger and articulate it better, but. I never cared what I looked like skating. What I cared about was what it felt like. Like as a as a kid in the 80s to be able to put to to be able to attach wheels to my body so that I could go places faster and like like I felt like I was becoming like a form of Batman or some like some some bionic version of myself where I now had superpowers and I could like fly around fly around Brooklyn and and get to the park faster and bomb these hills in New Jersey. Like to me, it, everything I did on skates was always, always revolved around the way it felt to do it. Like when I did a grind, like a, a true spin Mizu to me is uh, probably my favorite trick to do. Not because it's pretty, not because it looks good, but because of the way it feels to spin into it and to lock it on and, and how you can spin off of it. Like to me, I don't give a shit what it looks like. Like I, I love the way that trick feels. And when I see people skate, there are certain people that I watch that when I see them skate, it's not that I'm appreciating the artistic value of the way they skate. Like I, I watched uh, John Ortiz do a, uh, man, he charged and it was like this little two foot ledge, but he was charging at it like full speed. And he jumped up, just did a top acid on top of this uh, two foot high ledge. And it was like there was almost no impact when he landed. It was like he floated onto the ledge. He went so fast and, and probably slid 20, 30 feet. Like it was just, he was hauling. And then he came off super smooth and landed perfect. And to me, when I watched that, I'm like, man, that looks like it felt like super friggin' cool. Like just just flying like that and floating. And then, and that's one of the reasons that Vert became so attractive because you literally, when you start getting onto a good ramp that has a high roll in and you can get, and I was never able to air like like Sessa or Aton or or you know Chris or Rafael Santos like some of those guys man they they go like and forget about the Yasutoko brothers those guys are absolutely insane um, <laughs> but you know I was never able to go 10 12 feet above the ramp but even getting head high when you when you ride up a half pipe and you get overhead high on a on a half pipe then you feel like you're flying like it literally feels like that weightlessness and it's not like Oh, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I want to feel this adrenaline. Like it was nothing about that at all. It was just that 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 feeling of like weightlessness and fly. Like man, I I just loved it. And I watch skaters now, and there's guys like Demetrius George who, uh, dude, the things that I'm watching them do are just bananas. Like it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's really, and you bring up a good point too about like the difference in skating, like the elements that are between art and athleticism and there's like that balance between there of like uh you know what you're trying to contribute and and the art factor versus like the athletic feat factor of it all and um it's, it's interesting to hear about the, like the true mizu is your favorite trick i i would have thought like alley fish brain because that was like one of your staples on vert fish brains yeah i remember um, that too the alley fish brains and like the mu 540s and like the staples like and I don't know. From the outside perspective, it, it on this side, it did look like you were going as big and 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 hanging with uh, Sasser and and Edwards and all these guys. Yasutoko's 
granted they're in a class of their own, but yeah. uh, of that era, um, you were definitely one of the big dogs, especially on vert. And um, yeah, it was, uh, you don't see as, as much of that like vert being pushed today because there's not like ad, as much as an, an incentive because we don't have these big vert competitions. We're not a part of the X games anymore. So like, if people are skating vert, like, you know, Nell Martin to, to say one or like Miguel Ramos still maintains like that, that, that old art, that older, you know, more traditional art form in vert. Um, but I think you were really in like the era where it was, it was like at the, at the peak of like, I wouldn't say, well, definitely performance on vert was like some of the highest levels happening in your era. But I think it was also like one of the peaks of like the most exciting time to be a vert skater. Like just being such a big fan, like even like when I was looking back on some of the things you were part of, like vert triples was something that was in the X Games. That's if you think just thinking about isn't that is insane. Like vert singles is crazy to me, like just skating over it by yourself and vert triples. Like so now you're like bringing in like like what what was kind of like the introduction into like that or like how, like how does that even go like do you have a team like how how did that all work out the choreography on that is insane yeah, yeah and, and i loved it man it was it was cool that they were doing something that was geared more towards a little bit more towards enter, entertainment value and fun and at the end of the day like we want eyes we wanted people to see our sport we wanted people to watch it and we didn't have it God, it's so crazy to me. Like, I started, uh, I don't know if you guys know what a cable park is, but it's a wakeboarding place where you can wakeboard without a boat. Like, I started getting really into wakeboarding, and I now have, it, like, I'm not kidding, a 100,000 times the the content and footage of me riding a wakeboard, and I suck. I'm freaking dumb. I'm almost 50 years old, and I'm terrible at it. And I have probably a 1,000 hours of me on a wakeboard. And I have like one YouTube clip of me on a pair of rollerblades, and it's it's just crazy how how easy it is now to to get to get views and get people to to see it and to get get people to see what's what's capable and what's being done. Whereas back in those days, man, it was it was tough. So the fact that the that the X Games implemented something like that because because triples and doubles and stuff like that was a huge part of show skating, and you know we would start basically every show was the same. You would start off by by just barely getting to the top of the ramp. And then um, phase two was you start going above the top of the ramp and everyone's like, wow, look, they're going higher than the ramp. And then the next phase was you start doing tricks higher than the ramp and getting up about head high and doing like 540s and 720s and backflips and whatever. And then the finale was always throw a couple of people on the ramp. So you'd have two people do something and then most shows the finale type thing was a triple stack where you have three guys go in one guy just rides the middle of the ramp and and it's just basically doing a straight air as high as he can and then the two people below them would do a, an over under and cross underneath the guy that shoots straight up the middle which is one of the coolest and we used to like take turns on who would get to be the middle because it's the nuttiest thing you've ever seen because you got to figure totally. say the ramps 10 10 to 12 feet high and you're going to air let's say seven eight feet out of it i'm going to give myself credit that i didn't earn because i don't air eight feet but anyway you air seven or eight feet out of it and you shoot up and as you turn around and start looking back for your landing there's two people underneath <laughs> you that are crossing and as you you become weightless at the top and as you start to fall this little magic opening just goes whoop and you like shoot right through the middle of it. And it's one of the, the, the coolest feelings in skating. And I think any show skater from back in the day that did that triple stack. I mean, if you really go back and you look at the stuff, man, Chris Edwards in like 93, 94, 92, even dude, I saw him do a show with team rollerblade at orchard park in, uh, in New York. I actually built the ramp. I, I helped set up the ramp there. And I think they did a, a five person stack and it was what? just chaos. Like it was absolutely nuts. And they had uh, Jimmy Trimble, Alan Bono, uh, God, Chiasante wasn't there. Chris, oh, Chris Garrett, and maybe Pat Parnell. I don't remember. But man, they had five guys on the ramp all crossing over and under each other. And Man, it looked like absolute 
just chaos. I, I don't know how, it's, and and Chris didn't care. He just, Chris would just charge 100% and, and didn't care about anything. Uh, but it was awesome. But yeah, when they brought that to the X Games, it was, it was a little gimmicky, but at the same time, it was, it was something we had all done. If you skated vert back in those days, I don't think there's a single person that skated vert that had not done shows prior to that. And if you had skated in a show, you probably did doubles or triples. And uh, man, if you did shows with Matt Salerno and Sessa, who they were my partners in the, the triples that we did, talk about just being the, the weak seed. Those dudes are the, the, like I could hold my own. I could skate a vert ramp, but man, uh, Sessa Mora and Matt Salerno are like the elite of the elite. And those guys just killed it. So, so putting a run together with them, it was just basically like, you know, where, where do you guys want me to go? Cause <laughs> they're, they're nuts. Especially yeah. Salerno. That dude was incredible. Yeah, they're both. I mean, all you guys are insane bird skaters, but like, how do you plan those runs? Like, how much time does that take? I feel like you would need to spend like more time doing that than your individual run, which I feel like would be more important to the skater. You know, I would rather win the X Games on a my own run rather than like a triples run. You know, but the triples seems like it takes way more time to organize that and to practice it too. Like, how do you practice that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think the only practice we really got was doing the shows prior to that, and then we had time on the ramp you know, the day before to, to work out details of it. And, and, you know, we, we all spent so, spent so much time on the vert ramps back then that it wasn't too difficult to put together a run. Like you would basically, you know, you wanted to go over under each other. You know, we did some, some stuff where we were grinding side by side and, 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 you know, the, the, the physics of the ramp, just work so as long as one person's not going significantly higher than the other everything kind of syncs up as far as where you're at um you know it becomes kind of difficult when you got sessa who's known for going like as high as anybody in the sport and then you got salerno who and that dude throws some crazy crazy spins and stuff so it, it was challenging i'm not gonna say it was it was easy but it was probably easier than most people think just because we you know, we had done it before. We had done so many shows together, especially with those two. Like those, those are two of my best friends in skating. So we spent a ton of time together. Yeah. I had to pull up a clip because there's a lot of people watching now from a newer generation that probably didn't even know this even existed. <laughs> so as a yeah. visual, this is how crazy this is. Look at that five, four, wow, over. the five over <laughs> back to back too. You did it too. Mike. Back to back five, triple three fives in a row. And they're not even short runs too. I feel like with triples, like, 30 seconds is enough. <laughs> You're doing like a minute run here. Yeah, it's like, it, it's crazy to see a lot of this stuff because, you know, when, when, when you start looking, I, I really feel like you're from like this golden era in, in blading because when you look for a lot of this stuff, it's harder, it's not as easy as you would think to find on YouTube. Like you said, you have like a thousand hours of wakeboarding footage at the cable park and like one or, or just a few clips on YouTube. But a lot of this stuff is hard to find. I was even on the X Games uh, Wikipedia and I was looking for like the, you know, the X Games wiki and they have like 1995, like the, they, they list their winners. So they don't mention rollerblading. 96, they do the same. Don't mention rollerblading. It's almost like it's been erased out of there. Wow. And you have to like, you could find it, but you have to dig a little deeper. Um, so I, I feel like the, like, well, the, the nostalgic value of this stuff is like, is so high amongst the people that were involved and were able to witness it back in the day because it's really difficult to find nowadays. But w were you like, so you're in like the thick of it. You're like on tour with the X Games on ASA. I remember seeing you in Bristol, Connecticut um, years ago when it got rained out, the event, and I think it was 2000 maybe or 99. And um it was starting to go from something that was really big to something that was kind of withering down. W what was that experience like? And did you have any interaction like with the people who were running the event directly or like the X games of the ASAs and were they communicating like, Oh, this is starting to go on a, on a downward trajectory. Yeah, dude, it was, it was freaking brutal. And like, it's still like to this day, I, I still hold a, a crazy grudge. I know, I know everyone's supposed to be cool with each other and I see, 
even when I go to the skate park, there's there's skateboarders and rollerbladers and guys on scooters, and everyone's pretty chill. And obviously, I'm not gonna go around beating anybody up or anything. But man, I sat. <laughs> they don't want to play with you. <laughs> I've sat in rooms and and like heard. I mean, it was all built on rollerblading. If you go back to 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 the first X Games, I mean, I did I did shows with Tony Hawk where where I was sitting next to Aton. Um, where were we? Santa Rosa, I think it was. And man, Tony Hawk went up to Aton and was asking Aton if he had an extra set of. I ba- know oh, it wasn't Tony Hawk. It was Andy McDonald, another another big name pro. Came up to Aton. I was like, "Hey, man, do you have any bearings?" Like skateboarders couldn't even get a, a set of bearings. And when the X Games first started, it was built on the explosion of rollerblading in the world. Like rollerblading was it. It was the the, the pinnacle, like biggest part, whatever. And man to to watch that shift and watch that change and know that it was happening not because of the skating like it like the skating was getting ridiculous like what was being done on rollerblades during that like once you get to 2001 around that time that's when it got absolutely insane everywhere like if you look at the Mm -hmm. the difference in tricks from 98 to 2001 2002 especially on bird like what what the yastoko started doing sessa throwing just monster friggin' 1080s, Shane Yost mm-hmm. doing crazy stuff. Like, it was insane, absolutely insane. It scared the sh- right. crap out of me, like, mm-hmm. watching them and, and then possibly trying to attempt that stuff. Meanwhile, I get called into a room, and this is just a true story. I get called into a room where there's people from ESPN basically telling us that, that you know, Rollerblading's dying, like we can't promote, and I don't want to shit on anybody, but you know, at the time, uh, and I love the guy, I really do, the guy's a nice guy, but but Ty Chris was doing uh, doing really well in competition, and he was promoting himself a lot, and the ESPN was, was basically blaming that we were too, we didn't have enough like huge American stars to promote on TV, like skateboarding had Buffy Lassick, Andy McDonald, Tony Hawk, uh, BMXing had Matt Hoffman, Dave Mira, rest in peace. Um, mm-hmm. And in rollerblading back then, the the big names we had the Yastoka brothers, we had Ty Chris, we had all of these guys that were becoming big, and they were blaming on that. But then I'd sit in another room where where literally the skateboarders are just full on saying that that they want rollerblading out, that it's that it's friggin' weak it makes us look bad they're whatever and man they shit on us so much harder than probably most people know to get to get us kind of booted out of there and it's a hundred percent like 100 percent rollerblading left the x games for no other reason other than the top people in skateboarding basically said that either rollerblading goes or or you know we're not going to support you anymore so yeah, I was gonna ask that's about why, the, that's sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna ask about the B three days because that brings along to when B three was a thing. For people who don't know, it was bikes, boards, and blades. I guess it stood for. But everyone was together. I mean, it's kind of similar to the X Games too. But they promoted it as all three like together. Was it as bad as it seemed then, or like how was that? Yeah, I mean, they ESPN was constantly trying to make sure that like like. And they catered so heavy to the the skateboarding people, and you know we they would try to like push us off the course, make sure that we were nowhere near it when the skateboarders wanted to be there. Man, my my oldest friend and the, the the guy who was my best man in my wedding is Todd Grossman, who is one of the absolute original. I know. Did we lose Mike? We need him now. This is gold. As I know, there's so many good. Oh, I'll go back to the three piece for now. There's so many good topics of conversation that are happening with this too. Um, like so many good like behind the scenes stuff. This is definitely one of them too, and I'm loving this conversation right now. I hope um, he's just frozen right now. He's still in here, but as if anything else couldn't happen during this episode. <laughs> All right, hopefully he comes okay. back in, in a second. Uh, let's go back. to Yeah, us no. It, 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 we, we we need him back. Um, you know, recently, like Estrogen, Michelle Steinland made a post of uh, Tony versus Wolf, like uh, Tony Hawk and Jason Ellis have like a mm-hmm. podcast, and they're like, oh, we should bring we should put roller skating in the X Games. They should bring it back. 
I'm like, Tony Hawk, you're the guy. Like, it was your fault. Like, you were, like, pushing hard to get Blading out of the X Games. And then, like, in the comments, everyone was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, bro, this guy is so fake right now. I don't even want to read it, especially Jason Ellis. That guy was, like, the biggest hater on the planet. Yeah. But anyway, I'm not, trying, I'm, not, I'm not trying to go too dark there. But obviously, that's what happened. And it's it's cool that Mike's there to to confirm. And I'm, I'm, things are better now. We don't need to that, – that's old stuff. Like – yeah. Go to the skate park. It's all up. People are showing up. So I'm not trying to like reignite any hate or anything like that. Yeah. But like a lot of people don't know that what happened uh, to the downfall of rollerblading was not organic in any way. It was completely contrived. And like people were like forcing it to happen. Like the big wigs in skateboarding were like threatening people at ESPN. Like we're not going to be a part. We're going to pull our corporate sponsorship. If you don't pull blading, we don't want anything. It was a movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there you still see. You see some of that stuff looming in like the older guys these days, but generally like things at the skate park have completely changed. The culture culture has changed, but we have to acknowledge that that was a part of our history, especially when we're talking to people like Mike. Do we get him back? Is he back? Yeah, we, we got Mike back. Here we go. <laughs> okay, sorry, Mike, we lost him. Hold on one sec. We're good. But I was going to say oh, that yeah. like compare, comparing that to now, like if there was a B3 or similar type of event now, I feel like the vibe and everything would be completely different. Um, I could be wrong too, but the way that skateboarders, bikers, rollerbladers get along, even scooters or roller skaters, it's way different now than it was 20, 30 years ago, you know? Yeah, you can see that at the skate parks. Like when I go there and, and everyone, like it's such a it's such a chill vibe when you go to the skate parks now or, or even just skating around downtown, like everyone's super cool with, with each other. And I think a lot of it just had to do back in the, back in, back in those days, there, there was a pretty significant age gap between the core group of pro skateboarders and the, the top, top names in, in rollerblading where you had like our best guys, like the guys that, that were kind of the, the most famous, especially the most famous U.S. skaters, were all younger kids that were just thrashing it on, on street. And, and they didn't want to go and man god bless them for it they didn't want to like cater to the cameraman and and sit there and do a bunch of interviews they wanted to skate and man that's great but on the flip side of that you got guys like bucky lassick on a skateboard that and he'll and uh what's that other guy bob burnquist or tony hawk or whatever which and they loved when the cameras came out and they they'd give the the camera crew all the time they wanted to promote their sport or whatever <clears throat> and uh you know, it just it just took it in two different directions. But you're right. I, I guarantee you, if there, and I wish it did. I, I've heard uh, I've heard you guys talk about in the past, you know, the possibility of of rollerblading going back into the X Games, and and if it does, I and I'll be its biggest fan, and I'd be I, I'll be watching every single day. But I I really personally, I really really hope it does. I think I think the sport has become something that's just so far above and beyond. Like there's a couple of other sports out there. Have you ever watched guys on on BMX now? Like that sport has progressed. Oh yeah, insane. Like the things they're doing on bikes now are insane. Same thing with snowboarding and same thing with rollerblading. I think having a platform like X Games to to show it to the world, and it's just it would it would blow up overnight. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you with the BMX too. Like the uh, j just like how far they've come in terms of control. Like I remember, like landing backwards on a bike back then was like not possible. Now it's like such a standard in their industry. Like they'll do five forties land backwards, and I'm like, what the like? How did they get so good at this stuff? But um, but yes, I I I, I also like. It's it's interesting to hear that from you because I think the only time we've heard that story um, is from Arlo. And when we had him on our podcast, I don't think he was willing to kind of talk about it again because he had already addressed it. And Arlo's like, we have to, I've spoken about that. Let's move on to new yeah. things. But to hear you um, kind of confirm that is, you know, I think a lot of bladers felt like that for a long time. And there was like a lot of resentment because – uh, like, like I was saying, it wasn't really organic, the downfall, because like the growth was very organic. It blew up very fast. Yeah. And, um, and I could also understand maybe the frustration of skateboarding because there's like these young kids who maybe didn't have the same path and maybe like a little arrogance was there and maybe getting some, and, and they're like, wait, we've been doing this for a while. 
that all seems to ha to have settled now where you could look at, well, they kind of killed us in a certain way. So, so maybe that's why it's settled and who knows what will happen if we, we rise up again or, or anything like that. But I agree. I would love to see blading uh, on, the, on the X games. Uh, do, do you think that's something that's possible in the future? Oh, for sure. I mean, <clears throat> I, especially with, with, I mean, Chris Haffey has done so much for the sport, just being part of Nitro Circus and 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 probably nobody on the planet gets more general public viewership on a pair of rollerblades than that dude. And man, he does it right. He does it like right, right. The stuff he's doing is just absolutely bananas. I mean, anybody on the world anybody in the world can can watch Sean White on a snowboard and be like, you don't have to understand like what's going on. Like it's impressive. You you see it happen and you're like, damn, that's that's freaking impressive. And Chris Haffey's got that. So uh and I know a lot of guys got that. So I think if you give rollerblading that platform and you put them back out there and you give them the ability to do that sort of thing, so it's not just Chris um getting watched like that, then man, it, it's sky's the limit. And I know there's a lot of guys that don't want it. There's a lot of people that and that's fine. Like if if you, you don't want to skate on TV and get paid and have that whole whole aspect of it, then then don't do it. But I I look back and to some degree I did it wrong. Like I wish I could go back. I skated for the Gap clothing, which was the worst. I mean, I got paid pretty well, but it was the worst experience of my life. And I at the time there was a clothing company called Hangers from back in the day, and they picked me up and they gave me like my own signature pair of jeans and and shirt and a a shoe and all kinds of stuff. And they were amazing. There was a, a guy named Mike that ran the, man, it was an incre incredible experience. And then Gap and Levi's came on the scene and Gap offered me a contract and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. So I didn't even respond to him. I was like, man, I was happy with what I was doing. And then Levi's came onto the scene and then Levi's offered me a contract. And then Gap heard that Levi's had offered me a contract. So then Gap came back and offered me a contract and I told him no. And then Gap came back again. So I wasn't even negotiating like I was trying to get more money. I was just not interested in doing it. And I kept turning it down. And then they finally came back and offered me this ridiculous contract with, man, they're just going to give me a bunch of money and give me free clothes and all this stuff to, to just skate with a, a Gap sticker on my helmet and, and wear their jeans. I was like, forget it. Man. It was, it's just stupid to not do this. And at that moment, right. it made perfect sense. Like, why why on earth would anybody turn that down? And then I think back to, like, that's kind of the, the birth of me falling out of what I was doing. Because, man, those people, they would be at every contest and they'd complain about the placement of the sticker on my helmet. And I had, like, my helmet that was, like, my favorite helmet. And it was a little bit beat up. And they were, like, complaining that my helmet looked like shit and that I, I needed to get a new helmet. I was like, man, just leave me alone. And, uh, yeah, that was kind of the, the start of sucking and, and the money was great and whatever, but as long as, as long as people avoid that aspect of it and they, and they don't allow it to, to suck the love and the joy out of it, man, there's so much opportunity. Like I think back to the things we got to do and, and being a little bit older, there's a, there was a group of us like Ezekiel, Corey Miller, Sessa, myself that were, we weren't kids, man. We were, we were you know, older than most of the people out there. But because of that, when we went to to Venice, Italy or Rome or, or Germany or wherever, and we weren't like interested in just hooking up with some girls and, and partying like we all had. We were all in relationships. We we you know, we like to go out and have some beers or some wine, but we weren't out going to party and stuff. But man, when we went to Venice, we took advantage of the fact that we were in Italy. And the fact that there's a lot of skaters out there right now that are not getting to experience that part of it sucks because the skating's there. Like the skating deserves to be out there and the people that are doing it deserve all of those, those advantages that, that, you know, came to all of us back in the day. And I think all of us look, I've talked to a lot. I mean, there were people that like me and Josh Petty hated each other back when we skated. Me and Dominic Sagona didn't like each other back when, back back when we skated and now Jeremy Pettichini we... Jeremy Pettichini as well I have to throw that in there I, I remember yeah. you beef with Jeremy Pettichini quite a bit yeah 
<laughs> but I mean, we get, uh, now as 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 adults, we've all grown up. I mean, I've talked to Dominic. I, Josh Petty's come to my came to my jujitsu school and trained with me, and and we're cool as fuck now. Like it's, um, you know, just just dumb kids and no idea. But but you know, I look back and some of us older people from back in the day, man, we really took advantage of those things and got to experience so much. And and I look at what's be, what's being done out there and. I, I, I really, really, really hope that that the people that want it get the chance to experience it because they, they certainly deserve it. Mm-hmm. You bring up an interesting point, though, um, about how like um, when you were able to get the gap thing, there were some like issues with that. And it's funny, um, like they were kind of on top of you. Oh, you know, we're in the right sticker. And like kind of the thing that sucked some of the love out of it started to introduce itself. Um, and, and it's something that I've been kind of trying to be cognizant of throughout like all the years blading's kind of been in the dark ages because in that time we've had like this um, like complete like one goal which is just like let's get people to see blading let's get kind of back in the X games let's kind of get blading back on TV but I, I feel like people don't realize that if that does happen there's going to be like everything has a cost you know what i mean there's going to be some of those other bad elements that start to reintroduce them itself so i that's why it's like you know i hope blading gets to a place where the athletes can make money and thrive again and get to have those experiences but it's also like maybe at this moment we should also appreciate where it is now or or cuz it's like in this super honest healthy and real place so it's like you, you, you kind of like sacrifice one for the other sometimes. Do you think that that's uh, part of it? I mean, it definitely comes with some form of discipline. I, I think I look at the Australians and, you know, the whole Australian contingency. I, I don't even know if they realize how good they had it, but they had they had Sessa as like a father figure that like he was involved in every single skater's like contract negotiations, like, like traveling, like he really, 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 really took care of like that entire piece of our industry. So when you have somebody like that to kind of guide you and protect you, it's, it's, you know, you can, you can move forward into that world and, and control it and not, not have it have, I mean, there's always going to be some give and take, but the, the give can be pretty minimal if you, if you're, doing it right and you have the right amount the right type of guidance which you know at at points i sir i i definitely didn't like i man i did things that i hate that i did including skating for the gap and man i still i i'm not kidding in my sister's garage right now i probably have 70 pairs of gap jeans that are like (laughs) acid washed like weird style cut jeans that we use as like fire logs now to to start fires but i mean they, they, they just gave us tons of crap and but in, in you know big picture i i definitely regret you know where what i had to do with that and and what it did with with to, to me with how i felt about skating because it, de- it did it definitely it it affected the way that i i loved skating and you know it also back in those days most of the people only saw each other at at contests so like i spent from i got a pair of rollerblades in 1987 i spent from 1987 till 1995 skating with without even the option of there being a a sponsorship that wasn't even a thing that could possibly happen like even now somebody can get a pro skate and and get a little bit of a kickback and if you go out there i mean I friggin' went out when uh, Derek Henderson's skate came out. He's probably, I just like him because he's a fucking badass, but, um, and his skating's incredible. When his skate came out, I, man, I don't need a pair of skates. I've got, I've got two brand new skates sitting in my house right now and the pair that I'm wearing. And as soon as Derek Henderson's skate came out, I went out and bought it. Like I, and I, I skate that skate probably as, Anytime I go street skating, I wear the, my Derek Henderson skates, and anytime I'm on ramps, I wear my rollerblade skates. But so there, there still is even right now the people that that love skating and whatever and are doing it for the for the love and the joy and whatever. There's still that that carrot out there of potentially getting sponsored, you know, getting a pro skate, getting a pro wheel, making a little bit of money. I mean, it's nothing compared to what even I mean, if you look at what the top guys made back in the day, 
like I wasn't I wasn't in that that level of of sponsorship deals and things like that like I did all right but um but there at least even now there's there's some level of that but if you go back to prior to 1995 it wasn't even an option like I I put skates on my feet only because of how it felt and for the joy of it and the love of it and whatever um but yeah to get to your, to get to more to your point the there's definitely that concern that if you if you go down that route there there's you know potential pitfalls to it and without a doubt some people would fall in it um but hopefully with a history behind us now and having gone through it one time and and we all know and we have people that have that can lend some guidance and and you know listen to podcasts and hear stories and and know what what happened in the past that you know we could do it better next time yeah there's a, a lot of good stuff in here mike this is gold by the way and i love how this is kind of relevant to now because for the generation next generation of skaters who do get these opportunities for corporate sponsors like you yourself would you do you regret completely skating for a corporate sponsor like the gap or would you might have done them differently like different terms maybe in the beginning or, or something like that my answer to that question would have would change so dramatically based off of where i am in my life because right now like i have like a real job now like i i i'm an owner of i'm building 47 big health clubs all over the southeast region i i've already built eight of them we're in construction we have seven more being built right now um, so I, like, I literally ran here. That's why I'm in my RV right now. I ran here from a, a, like a huge business negotiation where I'm talking about multi-million dollar contracts. So what I know now versus what I knew even just five or six years ago has changed. So I don't, I would definitely do a deal if I went back to those days, like I would have no problem. I would have no problem doing a deal with Gap. But if I went into that deal, I would be much, much smarter about how it was negotiated and and laid out terms that I was comfortable with. And that's the, at the end of the day, that's all that matters is they want, they just want, they just wanted a gap logo on TV. That's all they wanted at all ever. And they wanted us to skate. I did a bunch of us did a commercial for the gap and that's all they, they cared about. Like I know that now they didn't care about me or anything. They just wanted the views on TV with the gap logo or whatever. I mean, I could have negotiated anything I wanted and I, and I could have even, you know, taken a little bit less money, but told them that, you know, little things like I'm not changing my helmet. This is my helmet. I'm not going to, this is the helmet that the sticker is going to be on. And, and, you know, as far as negotiating, go, negotiating goes, you can, you can negotiate anything. So I'm not saying that if I went back, I wouldn't not do the deal, but I would certainly structure the deal so that it was comfortable for me and what I wanted to do with my life and my skating, not what was comfortable for them. And I didn't even know that I had that, that power or, or, knew that I was in that position back then. Back then it was just like, these people are offering something, I can either take it or leave it. And that's it. And I think, I think most of us felt that way with the exception of maybe Sessa and Chris Edwards, because Chris did pretty well for himself back in the day and had some awesome deals, deservingly so, you know, he created the sport. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's really cool to like dig into like a lot of this stuff um, about like when blading was getting this kind of attention and also it's like fantastic to hear that you're like crushing it on the business level in yeah. in your current life uh, now that's so cool to to hear about the transitions but speaking about the transitions I would be remiss if I didn't get into your uh, MMA career and your and your introduction into that so I was doing some I mean I had heard years ago when you first started uh, like maybe in 2010 that you were fighting and I was, you, you had fights on YouTube and I was, I saw you like knocking guys out and I was like, oh my God. And I, I've recently came up and your record is 14 and four. Um, I, an interesting thing I, I thought is you started your professional career at 33, which is like a bit later. So you had this whole blading career. You come into fighting, which is one of the most like high demand athletic sports. Like it's like obviously extremely high cardio. It's like takes a, a hell of a lot of skill. You start at 33, you continue to fight into 44 and had your last six fights. You were on a six fight win streak, won your last six fights in a row. So um, there's a couple of questions I want to ask. I know you have a wrestling background. I'm curious to know like how the transition went from okay, we're starting to realize that the sun is setting on the blading career and where do I go next? 
what was the training jujitsu? Did it come organically or was it something that was just like, oh, I want to do this for fun. And then it blossomed into uh, a, a bit of a fighting career. Man, I, I think every single person that is good at jujitsu has the same exact entrance story or like basically onboarding story into the sport because the people that last, you, you basically everybody goes through the same thing and if you make it through that first part um man you'll you'll never leave and I, I just to throw this out there anybody that's listening or anybody that that has never tried it it is i mean talk to go talk to uh the monster or josh petty uh jaron grove or josh petty um those guys are killing it in in jiu-jitsu right now and i mean it's awesome to watch but anyway i what happened to me is I was a, at the risk of sounding slightly arrogant, I was a very, very good wrestler through high school and stuff like that. I planned on wrestling in college. My dream, my goal was I was going to wrestle for Penn State. And then I got hooked into skating and said, screw, screw college. I just want to skate everywhere. But I was, I was a very good wrestler back in the day. Fast forward, go through my whole skating career. Uh, and then... I was right about the time that I was going to have my first child and I was opening up one of my first gyms that I wasn't an owner, but I was, uh, I was one of the managers opening up this gym. And one of the guys that worked for me had a Gracie jujitsu tattoo on his calf. And I knew the logo, I knew what it meant. And I remember watching Hoist Gracie back in 93, um, when the very first UFCs came out. Mm -hmm. So I knew what it was and I started talking to him about it. He's like, yeah, I train. He's, he was still, or he had just gotten a blue belt, which is the first level. And, you know, we talked about it or whatever. And then he came up and he was like, listen, man, me and my buddy have some mats. Would you have a problem with us using the group fitness room and just laying out the mats and doing some rolling? And I didn't even know what rolling meant to me. Rolling was skating. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but I come to find out that rolling meant grappling. And I was like, I was like, all right, cool. And then he said to me, he's like, do you, uh, do you want to join us? And man, this dude was, his name was Kirk. He was maybe five, seven, 130 pounds max, like skinny little dude, kind of, yeah, he would kill me for saying this, but he's, he's kind of dorky a little bit. Like not like you would never look at him and be like athlete. He didn't look like a fighter. Right. He didn't look like anything. And, uh, so he invited me to come roll with them and i was like yeah, yeah i'd love to so i i showed up fully thinking i'm gonna grapple these guys and at the time i was working in a gym working out all the time i outweighed them by probably 40 pounds i was pretty fit and healthy and whatever way bigger and stronger than i was back when i wrestled so i was like man this is gonna be crazy i'm gonna murder this dude and uh no joke we started and in one hour he submitted me, if I had to guess, I'd say 50 times, and I didn't do wow. anything. Like, he beat the sh sh crap out of me, like, bad. It was the most humbling experience of my life. Because I, you know, you, growing up in Brooklyn, man, I was fighting kids when I was four years old. Like, I, mm -hmm. it's it's in our friggin', it's in our blood. It's like, we were just, you know, growing up in, in New York in the late 70s, early 80s, it was, you know, it was, a pastime was just messing like fighting with your friends and stuff and i thought i considered myself pretty tough my whole life i've considered myself pretty tough and here i do I, I step into a room with this tiny little nerdy dude and he beat the shit out of me for an hour and it was super humbling and man as big of an ego blow as you could ever find and that's the moment where every person that does jujitsu goes through that and then you have one of two choices you need to say that sucked i'm gonna avoid that for the rest of my life or that sucked. I want to make sure that never happens to me for the rest of my life. And so the very next day I went to the place where he trains jujitsu. And for those of you that don't know, jujitsu is magic. Like it literally is like somebody teaching you magic tricks. It's almost not fair. It's crazy. It's absolutely it, every single day I would go to class. I felt like the instructor was teaching me a magic trick and I got to use another human being as one of my props. Like it was, insane how good it worked and, and, as, and as someone who wrestled and fought my whole life i had boxed prior to that like I, it was crazy and i got hooked i went to every single lunchtime class i went to every single nighttime class i ended up i ended up giving every one of his students a free membership to my health club 
in return for two free private lessons a week. So I was doing every class plus taking private lessons for basically two years straight and just was obsessed and got super hooked into it. And then fast forward, I ended up moving to Oklahoma for a, a job switch and I had to leave my coach and go train with these other people who the place in Oklahoma that I trained at was at that point, basically like a fight club type place. It was just, you walk in and people are just trying to beat the shit out of each other, which was very different than the traditional jujitsu school that I was at, which was very like respectful and, and everyone was super nice. And now I'm in this place where everybody's roided out of their brains and, and <laughs> just beating it, literally beating each other up. But none of them really knew good jujitsu. And I had been training like real jujitsu for a while. And I walked into there with just my jujitsu skills that I had acquired and started doing really, really good. And basically tapping out these guys that were like 10 and 0 as pro fighters. And uh, anyway, I had no plans on fighting. I, it wasn't a goal of mine. I didn't train any stand up. I didn't do anything. I just loved jujitsu. And it was a it was a Tuesday morning, and I showed up for the nun, the lunchtime jujitsu class. And the instructor, uh, who's a good friend of mine now, um, comes up to me. He's like, "Listen, there's a an MMA MMA fight this Saturday, and one of the guys that fights at 155 pounds uh, got hurt, and they need someone to fill in. Would you be willing to go fill in?" And I'm like, "I don't know anything about MMA. I don't even know. I don't know. I don't. I don't do that. I just do jujitsu." He's like, "Man, you're doing MMA every day. Like." These guys are trying to punch you and they can't and you're submitting them. Just do that to this guy and they'll pay you like 3000 bucks. I was like, sold. I'll take it. And uh, sure enough, I went out there and I, it was my first fight. Uh, dude's name was uh, Josh. And I didn't know anything about him, but I come to find out that he's like a Division One All-American wrestler. He was 6-0. and He was the reigning friggin' champ. And they just threw me in there with him and I didn't know anything about him. Wow. And... Talk about second humbling moment. I'm looking across the ring at this guy or cage at this guy. And I'm training in a room with guys that are like 200 plus pounds, all roided up, like trying to kill each other. And I'm like a skinny little dude that that doesn't take any supplements at all. I don't even, man, I eat a Burger King every day. I don't even take protein <laughs> powder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I get in the cage and standing across from me is a guy that's my size. And I'm like, same deal i was like just like the earlier with the other guy i'm like man i'm gonna murder this dude look how little he is i'm used to training with monsters and the fight starts we come across the cage i go to grab him to trip him to the mat because i don't want anybody punching me or kicking me at all i just want to get to the mat where i can use my jujitsu and this dude wrapped his arms around me and i instantly knew i was i was screwed because he threw me on my head and I basically spent the whole first round just trying not to get killed as this dude just beat the living crap out of me. And he didn't land any punches. I was able to control it and do whatever. But, man, he had control of me the, the whole first round. And then in between the first and the second round, one of my cornermen come up to me, comes up to me. He's like, hey, you know you're allowed to punch him, right? And I'm like, all right, I'll try that. And uh, we come across the cage in the second round. And the, the fight's on YouTube, I believe. You can see it. But... I come across the cage and I throw a random punch that he wasn't suspecting and it hits him and he falls to the ground and then tries to grab my legs. And once he tried to grab my legs, he was kind of out of it a little bit. And I was able to lock up a, ch a chokehold and I put him to sleep. He was like completely unconscious and just laying there. And that was it. That was the, that was the first fight. And I won that first one. And I'm not kidding. That was in uh, an Indian casino in Miami spelt like Miami, but pronounced Miami, Oklahoma, in this tiny little place that held like a few hundred people. And I'm not kidding, the, the way that felt, again, it goes back to me doing things because of the way it feels more than, than what it looks like or anything like that. The way it felt in that arena, in that cage, just with the energy and the people, and in the middle of nowhere with only a few hundred people was 10 times more exhilarating and more exciting than what I felt skating in the Staples Center in LA on a half pipe in the middle of 20,000 people or whatever that place holds. And I was like, just same as jujitsu. I just became instantly hooked. I ended up fighting, I think seven times. Those records online aren't a hundred percent accurate. I took, I fought a lot of fights that are like when they're on Indian reservations, they don't get uh, listed on officials 
cards and stuff like that because it's technically not sanctioned by the state if it's on an Indian reservation, which a lot of states back in those days didn't allow fighting. So you'd have to fight on these like Indian casino places. Um, but anyway, I, I ended up fighting seven times in six months, won all seven fights. And then uh, that's when I got picked up by the WEC and won my first fight with the WEC and then went on from there. I love that the, the WEC had like all the legends were in the WEC, you know, Nick, Nick Diaz was a Donald Cerrone, like just go down the list. And later on, like UFC ended up uh, buying WEC, I think in 2009. But um, yeah, that, 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 when I was going into that, I was like, Oh my God, he fought at WEC. That's so epic. That's like, that's like fighting in the UFC, I think for like, in, in like layman's terms or like, and especially of that time, um it's so cool that you got into it at that era um and yeah like the just the timeline of it like 33 to 44 uh is insane to me like i feel like health is has health i mean i guess uh this is like a no-brainer because like you're owning these gyms and these health centers but i'm, I'm guessing health has always been like and and taking care of your body has always been like a big priority in your life yeah even back in the skating days like like there was a there was a group of us that would we'd we'd go to the gym every day and it wasn't, wasn't a vanity thing. Like we didn't sit there like posing in the mirror. Like we care about like, like it just, for those, for the people that are out there. And it, it, it's kind of funny because I saw later in life, all of the, the younger guys started getting into things like CrossFit and, and, and all of a sudden dudes like, I mean, even Arlo, Arlo is in freaking amazing shape. That dude's freaking shredded now. He's a dude's jack. Same thing with like right. Randy Spicer, like all these guys like got super into working out and it's just, man, it, it feels good. There's, it just, it feels good to feel good. And like when you feel, I mean, when I, I had a really bad sh shoulder surgery two, a couple years ago and, uh, from doing this ice cross stuff that I compete in and, uh, I was out for a while and I gained a little bit of weight. I, I, I wasn't able to work out and man, just the, the difference in feeling of just walking up a flight of stairs like it's it's crazy so when well, you know what it feels like to feel healthy feeling not healthy sucks and it's just again it's just a matter of perspective it's like it's like somebody who's been rich has a different perspective on what it feels like to be poor like if if you lived on the upper east side of manhattan and now all of a sudden you're living in the projects that's going to feel real different than somebody that you know dropped down just a little bit that that was already poor and now it's just a little bit more poor like the, the perspective yeah. of knowing what it feels like to be like really, really healthy and feel good. I mean, right now I'm, I, I'm super into running now. I, during COVID, I decided I wanted to see if I can run a five minute mile again and got into running and I'm, I'm running like, depending on what race I'm training for, I run like 50 to 70 miles a week now. So I, I still like my, and it just feels, like I said, it just feels good. It feels good to be healthy. And so it's always been a huge priority of mine. I mean, I'd sit in those rooms as the, the nearly, even towards the end, I, I, I fought in 2018, I think was my last fight, and I was 40-something years old, and I'm sitting in the, the weigh-in rooms the day before. I mean, I was in better shape than every single one of those kids. You know, I, I was literally signing the, my second to last fight, I think it was. I was signing to the fight card. The day before, you have to meet with the doctor and go over like they check your eyes and your whatever and make sure that you're you're not messed up and my opponent was standing next to me and you have to sign this card that that you were there and i looked over his card and the dude was born in like 1999 or 90 oh 98 God. he was born in 1998 and i'm like i'm about to fight a dude that was born like six years after i graduated high school it's ridiculous oh my God. But yeah i mean, I mean what is age? I, I, I've definitely gotten slower and, and my reaction time's not what it used to be. But as far as like just my health, I, I still feel great. Like I, I do. I take real good care of myself. Yeah, you I know, I, 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 I saw when I was going over your fight record, I saw your last fight, which was a win. I, I'm guessing the, the gentleman that was born in 1998, his name was Jay Ellis and they didn't have any pictures with it. And I was like, oh, my God, please tell me this is Jason Ellis. Because Jason Ellis is like a super hater skateboarder that like hates. I tried waiting. to fight him. No way! Oh god, he's in a, he's like a one eighty five er, and you're a one fifty five er, right? 
Yeah, he wouldn't take the fight. I told him I'd fight him in any way he wants, and he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't sign. Why? Oh, my God. That would have been so, so good. But uh, I, yeah. first of all, I yeah, love that, yeah. and I love that you try to hold it down for blading against that guy because <laughs> that guy was like – like the one of the most supreme haters of blading, like outspoken, and which is why yeah, I thought it was it it was laughable, like him and Arlo, I mean him and Tony Hawk talking about like oh bring roller skating to the. I was just like, man, these guys fake as all hell. But um, yeah. question, I gotta ask, and, and I don't want to focus. I want to talk about the ice cross, and we still have a couple more things to talk about blading before we uh, bring in some other questions from the audience. But during that time where. Uh, I know this was before you were training, but again, like you have some boxing history, some some wrestling history, and you grew up in Brooklyn, like fighting as as a hobby, like kind of like for fun with friends, like you know, just tussling around and and fighting whatever. But um, during the time when like a lot of those skateboarders were hating on, on blading, and like you know the early like the late '90s, the early 2000s, um, did any of them ever try to play with you or get fresh with you? I'd, I would imagine not. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Dude, there was there was a handful of guys. It, if you were to put together a list of of people out there that could really hold their own in a fight in all of those sports combined, there's maybe like five people. Like there's a BMXer named Kevin Robinson. That dude could that dude I wouldn't want to fight. I would even as as trained as I am now, I still probably wouldn't want to fight him. Dave Miro was scrappy as hell. That dude, I actually helped him one time in a fight. He was fighting, uh, God, I don't remember the guy's name, some other biker guy. Dave Miro could fight. Um, I would never fight Ezekiel. Eh? That dude, I watched that dude punch a friggin' oak door down with like a palm strike. Wow. I wouldn't, don't want to touch that dude. But yeah, man, like skateboarders talk back in those days at least they they talked a bunch but if you were in their face or if you if you were anywhere near them they were they were all they were nothing mm. especially it's the good ones to, it's that good to, it's good to like, know man, man jay uh, jason ellis is he like trains in boxing and kickboxing he has an mma fight and dude he has a show that he puts on and man i i offered to fight him he's like you get to fight a rollerblader on tv whatever and he wouldn't sign. He wouldn't do it. I had we had people calling to a show to try to to set it up, and he wouldn't he wouldn't take the fight. Damn. So makes he's sense. He's got he's, he's got too I'm much to lose. Knows, you know. He's got yeah. too much. To uh, lose. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. Like you know, it's like him, him getting his ass beat by rollerblading would completely destroy his whole brand. So yeah. probably uh, best to stay away from it. But uh, I, something I would have personally loved to see. Um, yeah. Okay, so it I, it was cool to touch on on your fighting stuff. I mean, it's, it's so much to to touch on with you, and I know Austin has things to say. But can you explain Ice Cross to us too? Because this is something I didn't know that you did. What, what is that? So Ice Cross is Red Bull. Back in the day, you know, they do all kinds of random, crazy events. Just the crazier, the better, just to promote their brand. They started something called Crashed Crashed Ice, which it's basically border cross but on ice skates so they build a downhill course out of ice that's got like big ass jumps and turns and and whatever and then if, the cool thing about the sport is it's so simple to so, so simple to explain you take four guys you start them at the top of the mountain they race to the bottom the top two go on to the next round then four guys start top two go to the next round until you're down to to four guys remaining those four race to the bottom and then you have first second third and fourth and it's like you're on a, a course that at a lot of places is only like eight feet wide solid ice going down a mountain with like full full like huge jumps where you're clearing doubles that are like like 20 30 feet and you know there's a bunch of like the yasutoko brothers have done it on some of the bigger shows when they went to japan uh, Richie Velasquez's kid is amazing at it. That dude's bananas. Like he's he competed in the whole junior circuit and like basically won everything as a junior, and then also competed in the senior division and held his own with like the best in the world. So Richie Velasquez's kid, uh, God, Jojo, Jojo is, yeah. uh, is uh, phenomenal at it. But I I grew up again growing up in the Northeast. I've been playing ice hockey my whole life. And it was like, I'm watching this sport where 
if you were to take the three things, the three things I would say that I've done the most in my life, it's, it's fighting, skating, fighting, rollerblading and hockey. And here's this sport where you're basically on hockey skates, going down over jumps and stuff and bombing hills while fighting other people down to the bottom. And you're not really fighting, you're not hitting people, but it, there's contact. Yeah. And uh, I was like, man, this is like, like this, like a sport that was created for me. And I, I, I've always wanted to try it and I never did it. And then finally I figured out what I needed to do to get involved and at least try out for it and do whatever. And uh, you know, they got it. They got a really, it's a super small community. It shouldn't be. It's one of the, if you, if you watch one of those things live, it's, it's so impressive to see in person and it, it doesn't really do it as much justice when you see a video of it or whatever, but they, uh, man, it's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. And it's super fun. And the, the people are cool, <laughs> real welcoming. And they, they, you know, do a real good job of, of letting people come in and try it. And this last event I just did, they had one in Maine um, in February. I took my son up to it and my son competed in it. And uh, yeah, it's super fun. It's, it's crazy, but uh, that's fun. I, and like I was saying earlier, I, I ended up taking a fall and it, it wasn't anything crazy. I've taken some, I did the winter X games in skiing back in 90, I don't remember, 98, 99. And in the prelims, ended up taking a super, super, super bad fall. And I fell from like like 40 feet just straight to my back. And I ended up walking away from it. But I, I like literally hung up my skate skis after that. I never wanted to ski again. I was like, it was crazy. And then I go on this ice cross thing and I, I like kind of like tripped. I didn't even like really fall that hard. And I caught my arm weird. Plus, I'm 100 years old now. So my body's not made of rubber anymore. And I snapped my rotator cuff, my labrum, my bicep tore. And, uh, you know, I basically lost almost a whole year just trying to get surgery and recoup that. So my worst injury of, of all of the things I've done is now from a stupid little trip on a piece of ice. But anyway, I've gone back now for the past three years since, or yeah, past three years since that happened. And I've done the, the events they have here in the States every year and, and I have no like aspirations or expectations. It's just super fun, and it's a it's a good community. It's a fun trip and good time. Yeah, your athleticism. I love that is you're so still diverse. doing that. Yeah, I'm about to say like your athleticism is so diverse. Doing doing that, doing you know skiing, MMA, rollerblading, you do it all, <laughs> and you kill it in all of them too, which is amazing to see. Um, I wanted to kind of bring it back to skating a little bit because when I think about Mike Budnick, one of the things, I have a clip here actually. When I think about Mike Budnick, one of the first things I think about is in Hoax 7, when you, Scotty Crawford, um, you know, Santiago, Blake Dennis, did this weird ass launch ramp into like a lake. And this is something that's like so cool. It's so different. It's so like unique just because you have a whole crew doing this, like jet ski. Someone had to build this massive ramp this before, like the mega ramp. Uh, before Nitro Circus, obviously. Um, I'm just yeah. curious how this whole happened. Like, what crew, what was involved in making this possible? Like, whose idea was this? So, uh, my buddy Todd, who was in uh, USC Film School, he was, man, what he's done for for stunt work and filming over the years is, is pretty remarkable. It's it's unbelievable. He's got, he's written books and stuff now. And uh, to him, really was just about experience. It was just about getting out there and he did it a hundred percent legit. Like he got permits, he had safety crew out there. He built the ramp. Like it was a hundred percent legit. It wasn't like, like every other scenario ever where you just sneak to a spot and try to get some good footage and whatever. Like it was a hundred percent. And he was doing it as a, as a learning process just cause it was the field that he was obsessed with. And like, it's what he loved to do more than anything in the world. And, uh, and, the flip side to that is we just got this super cool experience where me and Santiago and, you know, back in those days, Scotty, Scotty and Blake used to stay at my house um, for weeks when they'd come over to the States. So we'd go, we'd go skating at like RSA and, and, and skate every day. So this one time Santiago happened to be staying at my house as well. And uh, my buddy Todd called me and he's like, wants to do this thing and i'm like man i got the best best guys here let's go do it and we 
we drove out there. I don't even remember the name of the lake. It was like Lake Mead or no, it wasn't Mead. I don't remember. Um, like I said, I've been hitting the head a lot. But <laughs> we rented a boat, drove out to this huge dam, and literally spent the day in the sun skating with good friends. And man, it was a blast. It was super, super fun. I almost friggin' died though. The we didn't really realize that the ramp was just plywood, and the ramp had gotten wet. And there's one time where my my the I think there's a shot of it, but it doesn't do it justice. But man, my you slipped down the backflip, right? Slipped out. Yeah. And you you can't see again. Video doesn't do gives give things just do things justice. But man, that dam was stupid steep. Like it was scary. Like there was a, a point where we wouldn't go up any higher because you were just going so fast. You started getting speed wobbles. It wasn't like this clean mega ramp where you're just going down a nice smooth. I mean, it was, it was sketchy and, and but same time it was, it was super fun. And I mean, I, I bet if you ask Scotty and, and Blake and Santiago, they tell you the same thing. We had, we had an absolute blast that day. Yeah. It looks so fun. And it's cool to see stuff like that happen in skating because that, it's not just like someone going out and doing a skate trick and filming it. It's like a lot of work went into that. A lot of money went into that. Oh, no, we lost Mike again. <laughs> All right, let's go back to just us two. It's cool seeing stuff like that, and I want to see more of that stuff in skating. Just a lot of more effort than just going out and filming skate clips, which is fine too, but just to see something different, something something like that nowadays would like probably kind of go viral, like a nice crew set up, make a nice little video, and just not everyone launches into a lake like that. So... Um, just the idea of that w was really cool. And I thought that if someone did something similar to that nowadays, that it would get like a lot of traction and maybe like some outside eyes would see something like that. I didn't know if that was like the back end of what he was trying to do with that or what they were trying to do with that since that wasn't really, um, his plan, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. I've never seen that clip to be honest. And, uh, that looks like a lot of fun. And I, I can imagine that, uh, despite it going into water, like it's really scary to go that fast to any that ramp. Downhill? Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. And that was before like the mega ramp days. So it pretty much was like, I guess if you want to say like a street version of a mega ramp, cause it's just straight cement. And he, he said like, you get the speed wobbles dropping in any higher. And that was like back in the day, probably like 55 millimeter wheels, like not even bigger wheels like you would do nowadays. So I can only imagine how that felt um doing that but probably a ton of fun also you just launch in the water like that get picked up by a jet ski and just drag back to do it all over again that that looked uh it looked so fun you probably need a new pair of skates though right like how many how many times can you rip it on the same pair you know well when you're sponsored in pro i guess at that time you could get away just with like oh, another pair, pair of per try yeah. exactly <laughs> rollerblade be like okay you wanna you're gonna do this cool video okay we'll send you 10 pairs of skates you know they had that money yeah. back then that was like when louis first got on rollerblade he was like i'll be on rollerblade but can you send me 20 pairs of skates so I could give to people in my neighborhood. Like that was just like the money it was back then. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's insane. And I, I honestly, like, um, I know we lost Mike. I hope we get him back soon, but yeah, just even doing like the, the research into like learning some things about him during this podcast, like the fact that he's from Brooklyn and yeah. <laughs> all of us are born there. The three yeah. of us is cool to know. And, um, the fact that he, when be a pro skater, like in the highlight of like the time where it was like, he had gap sponsors, like gap, like most players can't even like fathom what it is to have like a gap sponsor and like yeah. put a sticker on your helmet, skate with the gap jeans. He has like 60 pair of gap jeans in like the, the garage <laughs> is hilarious. And uh, then like to go on to like fighting uh, 33 to 44. And now he's, I think 47, 48. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have to check, but he's still competing in like this, like, high endurance, like crashed ice stuff. It looks great. It looks like he's like in his thirties, like from like yeah. this activity all the time and still such a big advocate for rollerblading. Um, it's crazy. Like a lot of the people who've been involved in this. And I think it was like one of the reasons like we were interested in starting this podcast, like a lot of the people that are like have been involved in rollerblading are like some of the most interesting people, like, and it, like that's within rollerblading and like outside of rollerblading, like the trajectory of their life, going in such like different ways and different paths and ending up landing on his feet and like being like a business owner of like how many, I think he said like 40 something different facilities mm -hmm. going from managing a place to owning the places like have had a meeting before this podcast to talk about a uh, multi-million dollar deals with, uh, with other things. Yeah, it's just sick. It's really interesting to see. And it's uh, we, we, we have a, such a fascinating community. Do we have him back? 
No, not yet. But um, okay. He, he does make a good I, point. I saw though. you looking to the side. Yeah, I'm just so checking to see him. if he. I'm just checking to see if he comes back in anytime soon. <laughs> um, okay. he, he might have. I don't know if he's on his phone. Need like a charge or something like that. Hopefully, he comes back soon. But that just shows how staying active. I mean, he could have good genes too, but staying active really keeps you young because he's luckily able yeah. to do all this stuff, stay active. Um, I, it doesn't seem like he has a, a like a 40 hour week sitting at an office kind of typical day job type of thing. Um, but you know, I guess that's what he does. He's that kind of person. He's active. I think a lot of us are, are like that too. Like if we didn't have the option to stay inside cooped up, I know I'm like that. If I'm, if I'm home working for like a couple of hours, I'm like, I got to get outside. I got to skate. I got to ride my bike, something. And it keeps you young and stuff like that will help us skate longer. And you know what else will help us skate longer? If you check out uh, jump, the jump supplements, jump subs. if you go to jumpsubs.com, we have a lot, <laughs> lot of uh, supplements to keep you younger too. Um, you know, if you're having problems with your joints, we have the ultra joint flex. We have the platinum turmeric uh, multivitamin with energizing B vitamins. We have the krill oil for joint break and heart health. So give it a shot. If you also want to stay young, check out jumpsubs.com. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the bio. And also, if you want to support us in any other way, check out our online store too. We have a bunch of cool shirts, mugs, hats. Um, the winter is kind of leaving us right now, but maybe for people in the other side of the world, we have our Jump Street hoodie is still available on our online store. So check them out if you want to support us. And uh, we would greatly appreciate it as we still wait on Mike, which I hope he comes well, back soon. <laughs> well, it's always good to have a hoodie anyway, like even if it's... Uh... A different time of the year, but it's a good time to bring back the tank tops. We got the tank top season. The tanks. Yeah. The tanks are always um, good. Well, you know, we can show that we didn't get the opportunity to show. We, we do have a clip of Mike's, um, one of Mike's <laughs> earlier fights. This is like one of the first clips that I saw, like in like 2010, when I was looking back to like, wait, Mike's cage fighting now. So I like I YouTube his name and, and this fight comes up and I was like, okay, there he is. Like, you know, doing his jujitsu. Ju it's not got pretty up. serious. Yeah, this other guy looks serious. Oh. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's like see me being somebody who doesn't watch fighting or any kind of MMA or anything like that. Like watching something like that is probably somebody who doesn't know anything about skating, watching somebody do a backflip on like a launch ramp or, or like a, a vert ramp. It's like, oh, it's like sick. Like that's the one, you know? So yeah. That's yeah, it, 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 it's not as technical as like how the jujitsu can be like when you know you're grabbing the hand pulling it down like twisting around like spit like it's not as like a, a knockout i think is like yeah like the the, the backflip equivalent of rollerblading or like the double backflip maybe and it's like oh cool that's like something that you don't really need to be uh involved in to to appreciate and respect oh we got him back <laughs> welcome back sorry guys <laughs> no it's all good happy to have you back iphone suck battery died you guys hear me okay yeah we hear you you're fine right, cool. sorry about that um so i think in a second now we're going to uh we, we touched on some of the blading uh we touched on some of the fighting we touched on the, the crashed ice what you're doing now with business and and all your success it's such a fascinating life that you've lived so far and to hear everything going that way is just so interesting um, I think now we're going to open it up for some of our uh, questions for our Patreon uh, subscribers and some of our uh, people in the live chat, if that's okay with you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, awesome. All right, cool. Let's get it kicking. Um, while we let the live chat questions come through, uh, we're going to the Patreon questions because we prioritize those first. First one, uh, we kind of touched on this, but maybe there's a second part to this question that you could talk about also. Um, Tim S., uh, any stories about the X Games Vert Triples, which we spoke about, but he says teaming up with Cesar Mora and Matt Salerno sound fun. Are you still in contact with them? Yeah, I, I talk to Cesar pretty frequently, um, <clears throat> especially just commenting back and forth on each other's posts. You know, Matt, Matt, I haven't talked to Matt in forever. I think Cesar just reconnected with Matt. I may be wrong, but fairly recently. Um, and, uh, Matt got into, if I'm not, I might be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure he got into DJing and doing some other stuff. Um, but yeah, I still talk to Sessa a ton. And Sessa is still the same, man. Like that, that dude is, that guy is 100% hard. Like I've never met anyone in my life that cares more for other people than, than Sessa does. Like he, 
he gives a hundred percent of everything he's got to whoever's around him, whether that's his his new wife, his skater friends, the the people he was mentoring, and and most importantly me. Like he, like from the first ninety five Ness, he he like basically took me under his wing and and was like a a, a mentor. So yeah, it was it was great. It was like I said earlier, it was the best of times and. And it was a super fun event, and you know, those guys are just the best. So, yeah, Seth is a great guy. It's, it's good now that we have social media to stay in touch with all these people from For you sure. know friends from 20, 25 years ago. It's awesome. Um, our last he's picture. all he's also Sesser's Ses- Ses- I just want to say about Sesser he's a bit of a ninja like you know someone who, I mean, you've trained boxing so you know a lot of boxing like you're doing a lot of jump rope watching Sesser on the jump rope is like he's a real ninja on the jump rope if you follow like that's that's really not easy to do super high cardio stuff and super mm-hmm. skilled so he's uh up there with keeping his athletic form better than it seems to have ever been in his current age yeah man he's nuts I mean th- Talk about like the random set of skills that that dude has. He's, he's again, it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. He's one of those guys that we would be on the ramp together. And, and same thing I was talking about with guys like, uh, Sagano or, or Nick Riggle or Eric Burke, like these real artists on skates, like Sessa was the same deal. Like Sessa was an artist on his skates. Like he cared so much about how every trick looked and every grab. And he would try to instill that on me, and I we we I would like not listen to him; and it would piss him off. But uh, man, that dude's a great artist. He, if you've ever seen that dude with a yo-yo, it's insane. <laughs> we used to walk around the airport, and like he'd like get a crowd of people watching him play with his yo-yo and jump roping, juggling with a soccer ball. It's bananas; like it's crazy. Also, that dude, he was, he was like pro-level soccer player before he started skating. Yeah, I forgot about that too. I remember seeing him back in the day playing soccer, killing it too. Um, he's just one of those guys, like Chris Haffey, like just super talented in anything he touches. Um, yeah, sure. As soon as he said the yo-yo, I was like, oh, he's one of those guys. I I could yeah. tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our second uh, Patreon question comes from Tree Rudolph, who wants to know, Mike, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is probably Into Thin Air. Is my favorite like reading material book which is the i'm like super into like adventures and and i do a lot of hiking and trail running and stuff like that and i I have a goal of someday climbing everest um so man that that story of of you know that revolves around that book and i know they made a movie about it uh as well but yeah i I absolutely love that book i have a lot of I do a lot of reading that's more like uh, business stuff now, which you know, nobody cares about. But you know, Gary Vaynerchuk's got a lot of really good books that that I read. I've read a lot of good sales books, and you know, just like I I I do with everything, I want to be successful at what I'm doing, and and I've spent a lot of the last decade in the in the business world and and trying to get better and and learn as much as I can. So you know, typically right now I. I I read books that revolve more around that stuff. And I really love Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. I used to read some Gary V books too. It's been a while. I should probably get back more into that stuff, but yeah, his new stuff is amazing. Yeah. Good call. Um, that was it for the Patreon questions. Uh, Billy, do you have anything for the live chat questions? Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, so for the live chat, we always have some interesting questions on the live chat. We'll get to a few of these. Um, okay. So question for Mike, death row meal. (laughs) (laughs) It gets interesting in the live chat. Yeah. It's probably going to happen too. Is the real, real problem. (laughs) No. Um, I don't know. I'd probably keep it simple. I haven't been away from New York for so long. I, I miss my pizza. So I probably want some, uh, there was a pizza pizza place on 72nd and Columbus back in the day called the Pizza Joint Two, that uh, had the best like it's like New York pizza is the best pizza, but this place was the best New York pizza, so I'd want that again. 
Mm. That's, that's a, perfect. That's awesome. That, 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 that answers actually another one of our questions. Someone was asking your favorite New York slice. So we actually knocked two out of the park with that one question. Oh. <laughs> um, Lander, who is a frequenter in our live chat, he says, any message for blading in general? It's a good question. That is a good question. You know, it's it's so different now. I mean, the ability to 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 get out there and and use social media and you know have this kind of platform to show what you're doing. I mean, I've seen guys, the guys that are doing it and doing it right. I mean, I wouldn't know. I would. I mean, I knew Derek Henderson back in the day. You know, when he was a I mean, he was a kid when when you, know, you go back into the, the late nineties, early two thousands, he was, he's super young, um, in comparison to my old ass. But, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't know what those guys were up to right now. Like, uh, if it wasn't for social media. So with social media being what it is and the ability to like really get things out there, like I just, I, I like seeing the guys, even Chris Edwards getting back into it and using social media so much to, to really kind of spread the love and, and get skating out there as much as possible. Um, uh, that's what I like to see. I, I like, I like to see that direction in the sport. It's just, um, I have people literally because people know skating's in my background. Like I know it's getting out there now because people from my work environment, people from my fighting days, from my jujitsu days, I get clips sent to me constantly from random people that have nothing to do with skating of some badass skating trick that they saw on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, mm. or uh, Facebook reels or whatever it is that they just came across. So I know it's getting out there and I know it's getting viewed by people that have nothing to do with skating, which is exciting. And it's definitely a, a great sign for, and I, everybody feels that. I mean, you go to blading cup over the last few years and it's like, man, the energy there and the, the, the atmosphere and I, I really feel like this this deal is on the verge of of another significant explosion you know the first one that happened in the from late 80s into the early 90s the rollerblading ex, ex, explosion had nothing to do with aggressive skating it was rollerblade the company was selling some insane number of skates day over day just because of the explosion of rec skating and skating around the park and whatever so it was just so much, I mean, everyone on the planet was buying rollerblade skates at, during that time. So there was just so much money coming into it. Whereas I think this next one that's kind of on the, like starting to happen right now is going to be so much more just pure. And it's going to be about the stuff that we do and not just us kind of lumped in with everything else that is being done on a pair of rollerblade skates or, or inline skates, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I think this, this, and skateboarding went through the same thing. Like skateboarding had its eighties skateboarding. And then that next kind of phase was the one where it was really just all of its popularity and all of its energy came from the stuff that we were doing. And, and it's exciting to see. I think, I think, I think it looks bright here for the next five to 10 years. And I expect big things. Mm -hmm. I love that energy. Um, so we got a couple more good ones. Uh, I will take these and then I will ask you our final questions and then we'll let you go. But I just want to say thanks again for, for joining us on this podcast. It's been amazing to like catch up with you and everything. And if you're watching us live as Austin's showing right now, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Um, so um, Matt Gallego and someone else asked this further down in the chat too. You compete in a lot of different things. What do you enjoy competing in most and why? <laughs> That's a good um, question. Honestly, I, I am. I'm, I'm super, super, super competitive. And I, I, I love the feeling of competing. Um, uh, I think that's an easy answer, honestly. Fighting is my favorite thing to compete at. The, the only toss-up is... Something like fighting and something like running is just those two types of sport are just as pure forms of competition as you can get. Like people were racing from here to there since the the birth of humanity. Like 
like as a kid, it was like, I'll race you to the stop sign. Like it, and it, and there's nothing that else that goes to it. We're both going to start from here. We're both going to finish there. Whoever gets their first wins. It's that simple. There's, there's nothing else involved in it at all. You know who, you know who win. It's a, it's a simple form of competition. You know, MMA gets a little bit complicated because you have judges involved and if the fight is not finished, whatever, but in its purest form, fighting should be about the same thing. Like, two people go into the, the cage and one person wins and one person loses. And, and it, it's just, it's a pure form of competition. And I, I love it. And the cool thing about MMA that people see it, but I don't, I don't know if anyone really understands it or whatever, but boxing and wrestling are different. MMA is so it's crazy. Like every single fight I've ever, I am friends with every single person that I fought, like somebody that I have literally tried to rip their heads off and punch them as hard as I can. I'm like <laughs> great friends with every single one of them. And the second the fight ends, you are instantaneously like bonded to that person forever. And you watch every UFC fight ever with the exception of the people that are like playing a part and selling a story. But for the most part, right. every fight ends, even the guys that are like that hate each other, every fight ends with a, a huge level of respect and usually a big hug or something like that because it is it's it's this just this pure form of competing against another person and at the end of it there's there's just you know i know what i went through to get to that exact moment and i know the other person went through it too and there, it just comes with a certain level of respect and so competing in that world is, is definitely my favorite mm -hmm. that was a long i love that man and I, I love that answer, and that makes perfect sense. You know, you, you look at running, and you look at uh, not just MMA, but fighting in general, and it's like, uh, if you think about it, it's like the oldest sport, really. I'm going to run to go get that piece of food, me and this caveman, or we're going to fight over whatever. It's like the sport before right. sport. So so it's something yeah, yeah. very primal about it and very cool. Um, and, and yeah, like, it, you know, before I get into these next, I'm going to take two more questions because we had a really cool one pop up. But uh, I think a lot of your story, uh, it's a testament to like what dis discipline can bring. Like, you know, discipline in all forms is so important. And it's obviously been fruitful for you to be a disciplined person, not only as a pro skater, inline skater, roller bit, whatever you want to call it, but a fighter. And then in, in the, the ice cross and in business, just like discipline will, will take you far. So it's something good to, to, to develop. And you seem to be a testament to that. Yeah, I, I, just to hit on that, because that's something that, ironically, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, talks about a lot, and I, I believe it's it's the, the secret sauce is that so many people get caught up in doing things for for bad reasons. Like people have come up to me for years. Even my my buddy Todd, who's a huge film guy, was telling me back in the day, like literally ten years ago, I should be on YouTube. I should start a YouTube channel and and just film my life and my kids and my this and my that and with my skating and my fighting and jujitsu and and my kids are doing all these cool things and my son is like this badass athlete and like people would love it but at the end of the day i have no interest in carrying around a camera editing film it's just not something i love so if i were to do it i would be doing it purely for the fact that i thought it would make me a bunch of money and and whatever and I know that I would not have the dedication or the drive to do something if it was if it was built around that. But all of those things that we're talking about, like, man, I wasn't doing jujitsu because of any impure or any financial or anything. I was just doing it because I loved it. So it was super easy. It's so easy to be dedicated and driven to do something that you love to do. Like skating back, skating was this thing that I would drive seven hours round trip and pay $40 in gas and $20 in, in park fees to, to get to skate. So, and like when you have, when you're doing something that you love that much, finding the, the drive and the dedication, it, it's, it's almost a non-factor. It becomes easy. And I have that with my, my, my business life too. Like if I was in an industry that I didn't love, like I love the fitness industry. I really do. And, and, you know, it's not for everybody, but it's, it's to get to go to a place every day. Like all of, all of the gyms that we've opened where every single person that walks in there is there because they want to make themselves better. So, so you're constantly surrounded by people 
that are trying to be good or be better. And that's, that's infectious. It really affects you. So again, it's just another thing that I really, really enjoy and I love. So it's easy to be driven and dedicated when you're, when you're doing something that you really love, which is something that in some of those books that I read that Gary Vee talks about a lot is man, find the things that you're good at and double down on those. Like forget about trying to strengthen your weaknesses or whatever, and double down on the things that you're great at and the things that you love. And man, it's easy. Like the rest becomes easy. So that's well said. I love that. That's a really good piece of advice. Um, before I take this last question, um, is there, you know, I ended up connecting with you through uh, Dragon Eyes on Instagram and he gave me your phone number, but is there, do you have a social media? Do you have a YouTube where if people want to follow you, catch up with you or see what you're doing on every day? Is there some place they can go to follow? It's on the screen, I guess, I, right there. That's Instagram. Yeah, I have, an Insta- I have an Instagram that I mostly use to, for the most part, to post about my kids and my gyms and stuff like that. I, I, I don't do a ton online. I do post. Anytime I go skating, I'll post a, a couple of clips. When I go to Blading Cup, I'll get a couple of, cl- a couple of clips. When I go wakeboarding or to Ice Cross, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put, post random stuff on there. I'm not super active on, on social media, though, but I do have an Instagram and a Facebook and whatnot. I don't even know what they're, what the names are of them. I don't do anything on YouTube. <laughs> well, we, we got your Instagram up one here, so uh, we, we could follow up with that. But we'll take this last question before we give you our parting question from, from the audience. Uh, Nicholas Budnick, I'm, I'm guessing this might be your son or um, maybe a brother. I don't know. But what's the best defense to a Mike Budnick guillotine asking for a friend? <laughs> <laughs> That's my nephew. <laughs> there, there is no defense to it come on now <laughs> there's, there's there's one thing that's a given if i get my arm around your neck you're going to sleep <laughs> that's it oh, that's the best answer <laughs> um well i just want to thank you and thank everyone for joining us in our live chat um and thank you for sharing these stories with us um we also see Kerry Budnick is in the chat. So we've got some of the family in here watching, checking Welcome it family. out. So thanks for coming and joining us. Um, it's been great to have you on. And maybe we could do this again in the future uh, to go through some past stories because it seems like there's a lot to go through. But before we let you go today, um, do you have any uh, shout outs or any, any, any thank yous, any parting words uh, to, lead, to impart on the rollerblading community or words of wisdom, if you will, before we let you go? Yeah, I, I, I think the biggest thing is I, I talked a lot about the, the people that were most influential to me, guys like Sessa, Ezekiel, Corey Miller. Like there, there were a lot of people that were huge parts. Corey ended up not only being one of my best friends, but being the team manager for Rollerblade. And man, he took such good care of us. Um, so, I, I mean, I mentioned a lot of that stuff. Uh, another person that that was just absolutely huge for me when you go back to being from New York and being a, you know, starting out as a street skater. I used to go to Blades on the Upper West Side for like Tuesday, Thursday night skates. And uh, every now and then, um, Nick Hartman would come out there and he was the first person to give me a, a sponsorship. He, he put me on FR like very, 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 like I was nobody. Um, but he put me on FR before I was really doing anything. I, he, he got, he took a photo shoot of me, did like a photo thing for me for inline magazine and, and, and sponsored me, ended up giving me a pro wheel. And, and, uh, and that guy was, that dude is just such, uh, an absolute, icon to to skating in the in that new york scene and man he played a just a huge part in not just just not just me but so many people getting out there and and when when things were blowing up in california and it was just so easy to like find work and skate and skate spots and ramps and it was just so easy on california and new york man it was tough like we we had a good street scene but if you wanted to like do shows if you wanted to go to get to some ramps or whatever and it was tough and to have to have someone like Nick out there who was you know doing his thing and starting companies and like you know those those early guys that really pioneered the first companies like Senate and FR and England and like the real the the early day 5050 um and god bless all of those guys cuz the sport would have been absolutely nothing 
without without those guys stepping up and really creating the culture that 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 it became so um anyway nick nick is just a he was a he was a huge part of it mm-hmm. that fr sponsorship makes a lot more sense now knowing that you're from brooklyn <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, but I knew this was going to be an awesome episode, but it exceeded my expectations. So, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show and doing this with us. So much cool stuff in this episode. Everyone watching live, thank you so much. Like Billy always says, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. If you like what you see, drop us a comment down below. And, Mike, thank you so much again for coming on the show. And we'll see you all on the next one. Peace. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.